Good morning. Good morning. 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 If you read the board, you know what the title is today. Something that is very familiar to all of us in this in this world, the day and age we're living in. It's always been around, but it's really, 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 really cranking up. And every day it cranks up like a you know exponentially, like it wasn't quite like that the day before. And that is apostasy. And it brings madness, and as we very well see in our world, madness is all, all around us, everywhere. There's no, no place in life where madness is not in control in some form or fashion, even though it has titles that are impressive, maybe. But it's nonetheless madness because it is godless. And so just to make sure we're all on the same page, apostasy, according to Strong's, means a falling away from God's truth, which means his word. And this is a truth that is conceptual because that's what spiritual conception, I mean, spiritual truth is. Truth is a spiritual concept. Truth is something that's believed and acted on or not. And by this very definition, one has to believe God and his truth before one can fall away from it. A lot of arguments out there, none of them hold water with Scripture. Just knowing about it isn't enough. It's not even in play, as some like to claim. It has to be personally owned before one can turn away from it. It's a matter of trust in God and his word. One can't go down unless one is already up and vice versa. One can't leave a place unless one is in or at this place before leaving it is possible. One can't throw away God by not having faith in him any longer unless one possesses it to be able to throw it away. And mere empty profession to have it is not actually having it no matter how much it is believed. A lot of people are falling into that category. Unfortunately, family members of ours, all of us can attest to that to some degree. It's very sad. So in this way, really believing as in James 2.24 and really loving as in John 14.23 and 24, they're equal. Both must be acted on to substantiate them. If you love me, you will do my word, Jesus says in John 14. James says, if you have faith, then you're going to have works to show your faith. It's interesting, isn't it? So incredibly, there are those who claim that falling from faith means never having had it. Of course, that's nonsense. I just explained that. You can't fall from what you don't have. Obviously, it can't be the case. Just from a common sense perspective alone, besides this happened since the very beginning with the fall of Adam and Eve, didn't it? We're not told that neither Adam nor Eve quit believing God. They were simply tested. And they were tested for obedience. Are you tested for obedience? Am I? Every day, really. And what he said would happen if they disobeyed was also clear. If anyone knew of faith, it would have been Adam. And we're told in 1 Timothy by Paul that he wasn't deceived, so he deliberately risked his eternal life not to lose his help meet Eve. He was right there when the deception came upon her. Of course, there's also the possibility that Adam's faith in the Father who created him was so strong that he knew God somehow would pull him out of this. And he went ahead and took the chance. Many people may not think along those lines, but it's one possibility, that's for sure, because we're told he wasn't deceived, so he didn't do it out of ignorance. He didn't do it because he was deceived. He didn't do it out of spite. Why did he do it? The answer is the same as why did Christ go on the cross for us? It's exactly the same reason. That's why we're called the Bride of Christ. And he's called the last Adam. Interesting, huh? 
So we read about periods of strong faith interwoven with periods of unbelief and even outright denial of the Lord throughout history, both of Jews and Gentiles. And apostasy is the direct result of not believing God after having once believed, but then dropping the ball and turning one's back on God. Mark 4.4, 4, Jesus talks about that, the four types of soil. They all receive the word, and one receives it gladly in their heart. And then they let it go because of the cares of the world, etc. Now, again, to those who claim this can't be done, I've preached on this many times over the years, but it seems like it keeps cropping up its ugly head, as it were. So those people, I would advise them to read all the warnings that are in the Bible about staying the course, keeping the faith, abiding in Christ, fighting the good fight, making personally sure that one is still in faith. Ezekiel 3, 20, 18, 24, 33, 12, Hebrews 1, 2 and 1, 6, 4, 5 and 6, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Colossians 1, 23, 1 Timothy 4, 1, 6, 20 and 21, 2 Timothy 4, 7, 2 Peter 3, 17, and on it goes. So consequently, every... <clears throat> or any, rather, true believer needs to be diligent not to fall for unbiblical trash. Are you diligent? Yes. You got to be, because it's all around us. I got to be diligent every day. Even in some of the more or less new stuff that we're studying and have been for a while, you got to be very careful not to put as faith, like it's God's word, someone's opinion. And it may be a good opinion, it may be a right opinion, it may be true to Scripture, but it isn't Scripture. And that, that difference we always got to make sure we have an understanding of. Now mainly I'm talking about, you know, ludicrous so-called denominational doctrines found in not a few mainline evangelical denominations. And that's, you know, it's bad enough that Roman Catholicism with her outright lies uh, but evangelicals have jumped on that same bandwagon and married into that garbage. I once had an acquaintance tell me after somewhat a disappointing life up to that point that she was returning to her faith. She meant the Roman Catholic Church. She didn't mean she was returning to Jesus. Rather, the church. And it's this kind of delusion that just really has taken the world by storm. And from that then comes complete and total unbelief, denial of God, and all the rest of it. It starts somewhere. Always starts small, just like a, a little match about that big. And next thing you know, the house is on fire. The whole forest is on fire. And James, or Peter, one of them, I think it's James, even says that. How our tongue can light a whole forest of fire when we speak unkind things and false things. <laughs> There's a YouTube claiming to list the top 20 countries that have the most Christians. I found it amusing. Uh, the USA was named number one. We're the most Christian country in the world. With 230 million Christians, that's out of a total population of around 320, plus or minus, what complete nonsense. People look at this and buy into it. So being majorly convinced about certain things about the Bible that the Bible teaches, but which are not actually in the Bible in any way, shape, or form, is madness. It's part of this apostasy. Some people who claim to believe and go to church and, and give and you know do bake sales and all this kind of stuff and car washers with their kids and youth group and all this kind of stuff, and they're, they're doing this. They're doing all that stuff, but they're still not with the right Jesus in the right format. That's madness, too. And madness is certainly what we have in today's world all over the place. It's always been with us, as you know, from the garden, but it was augmented by various degrees of godlessness among humankind, and we know this, too. The trouble is there are those who once believed but no longer do. And then you add to that the ones that may have believed but then threw it away. 
And then they are in league with those who've never believed, and both are nowadays in powerful positions of authority and influence. That's what we have. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this godlessness really increased since World War I and came to its zenith after World War II. It's the reason that both major conflicts were instigated by the devil. He senses it's time. And many scholars reckon the, last, the beginning of the last days being in 1871. It's amazing. Or 1882, I'm sorry, 1882. 71 is a different date. 1882 is like the beginning of it. And when you check it out with the Zionist movement, that's about right. <laughs> Satan knows this too, and that's one reason he knows it. He pushed that very thing. So the powers that be, the spiritual forces of darkness who own the souls of just about every politician in the world and thus control world politics, they've laid evil down as law. Anybody know that? Mm -hmm. None of it is new. All of it is evil. Nevertheless, ow, almighty God has the last laugh, according to Psalm 2, 4 through 6. And I quote, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. <laughs> the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath. That will be the great tribulation. That's how he speaks to the world. And distresses them in his deep displeasure. It's not just displeasure, it's deep displeasure. Yet, he says, I have set my king. It's already done. I have set my king on my holy hill, Zion. It's already done. It's like over. <laughs> I love it. So already since the cross, we know this, and the resurrection of Christ, all authority and rule was handed over to Jesus. Satan could not stop the Lord in the grave to keep him from coming up. And there's no true authority except Jesus's. It's why Paul tells us in Romans 13, 1, that there is no authority other than God's and the authority that exists is ordained by him. Because Jesus has all authority. That means there's no other authority that he doesn't have. <laughs> Ow! If I had a pen, I'd go zero on authority. <laughs> So the reason we have lawlessness in the entire world is because the world is apostate to the word of God, to Jesus, and apostate to his report, the Bible. This is madness. Total madness. They see it as progress, but it's madness. That's why they call themselves progressives. John the Apostle wrote in 1 John 5, 19, that we believers, we know we're of God. Why? Because he promised that you believe me, you have eternal life. But the whole world is under the influence of the evil one. So when one combines this with Proverbs 22, 7, it's astounding that professing Christians still blab on about some democratic self-rule and freedom in a Christian U.S. of A. And folks, this goes so deep when you look at this, this whole socialistic movement. Hundreds of years they've been working on this to get everybody dumbed down while thinking they're free. They vote for something they've already been implanted to vote for. It's already in their brain because of the advertisements and all the garbage that goes with it. They think it's their own choice, but it really isn't. That's why you only have two, and you choose one of those two. One cannot possibly be more deceived than what we are today, except we're going to be tomorrow. That is, not us, because we know we're of God, but those who don't know the Lord and don't want to know the Lord. So we all decide God's word, is it the truth or not? See, if the rich rule over the poor, and if the borrower is servant to the lender, and if the whole world, that is all of it, is under the power of the devil, how could something like democratic self-rule resulting in true freedom even exist? One of those isn't true. 
I know a bunch of people who call themselves Christians, and many, hopefully all of them are, but they are so ate up with wanting to turn this place around. No, they didn't work on all this for hundreds of years and gain all the positions and all the power and all the money for nothing. They have a master, they have a God that they follow. And God allows it. So true freedom ultimately means the power of choice is not hindered in any way, shape or form. That means it's not predestined. That means it's not pre-programmed, prescribed through media. Unfortunately, it is. With all these people, the world is its own worst enemy, and they're steeped in madness. You heard of mad cow disease, and when a dog gets mad, you know, uh, starts foaming at the mouth and all that, rabies, it's mad, it's mad, 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 mad. When someone is mad, you know, they're ready to go off, you know. That's what the world is, and it is going off. The world is going off. And you and I are going to be the main target, and we are already, but we're going to be the main target more and more and more. Many wonder and even blame God for allowing Adam and Eve to sin, since he already knew they would disobey him. Makes sense on one hand, if you're not really thinking, but that's how they attempt to alleviate their own guilt. Since God knew he should have stopped it or kept them from being deceived, that's what they say. But because he knew it doesn't mean they knew it. But they had to find out. What's more, God told them exactly what would happen if they disobeyed. They didn't disobey without a reason not to. Have you disobeyed without a reason not to? No, we all know what's right and what's wrong. They had every reason. They were warned. If you do this, that'll happen over here. They must have thought he was kidding. They must have thought he was a joker, stand-up comic. Eve, anyway. So this Garden of Eden episode was the very first rebellion or apostasy against God by his newly created humanity. But there's much more to that story. There was already a plan brewing by God's heavenly creatures who were created before mankind, and they didn't want to allow this new species of life to have dominion of any kind, anywhere, especially over them. Who gets to rule over angels and judge them? It's us. Mm -hmm. Who gets to rule over all the creation that God made it for? It's us. Hallelujah. And notice, too, where they were. They were in Eden, the place and domain of God. They had food. What are they threatening us with now? Food. The prices thereof, the delivery thereof, the unavailability thereof. But they had food. They had shelter. They had dominion over all other creatures and the ground itself. Think about that. Having dominion over the ground they lacked nothing, so they weren't suffering from sickness and disease. They weren't weighed down with all kinds of psychobabble issues of low self-esteem, lack of friends, lack of self-love, lack of real love for him who is love. They lacked nothing. All these things are excuses today why we have criminals, why we have this, why we have that, why we have a bad government, why finance don't work. It's because somebody didn't go see Freud. It's crazy, absolute crazy. They lacked nothing in the garden, and yet they sinned. Let that run around your brain. So in its simplest form, apostasy happens, or at least starts to happen, with self-deception. And deception is possible because of desires for things in addition for what we already have and possess. We're told very clearly to be 
content with what you have. Be content with it. And if God increases, yeah, fine. Take the increase. Continue to be content. If he decreases, continue to be content. God will never decrease you to where you have nothing unless that's a lesson you need to have because you have kicked him to the curb at some point. But all this ties directly in with quantity versus quality, doesn't it? Think of it. There's one thought. The desire to have more of whatever is a big part of the problems that necessarily follow. And if you really look back in your life, and I know you do, we could have spared ourselves a lot of heartaches and other pains if we only remained content with the good or decent life we already had. As if it were... Uh, or as in where we were or what we wanted otherwise. This is why patience is said to be a virtue. Some say that I'm impatient. <laughs> That's true for this over here, but it's not true for some other things. I'm very patient with many things. And other things, not so much. I know I'm the only one in here who's like that. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bang, zoom. So yes, the positive from God and his word brings madness, and it is madness to think or worse believe that the grass is greener on the other side. But that's what, what the temptation is. Man, it's just better over there. There's more money over there. It's warmer over there. It's something is more comfy over there. It's more friends over there. There's something over there. And then when we get there, and it's not until we get there that we find out it ain't what I thought. <clears throat> yeah. Because most of the time we have no clue what the other side looks like in actuality. Still we pursue it getting there totally blind, but we think we see. Just like the Pharisees, you guys are more guilty because you say you can see. Mm. Wow. <laughs> So we're guilty ourselves for causing our own problems much of the time. It's just easier on the brain to blame somebody or something else. And this is where the whole socialism thing comes in. They have perfected this blame game. You know, self-examination isn't a favorite thing to do. But 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul says, Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. And with God, it's a, various, or a very serious thing indeed. There's a time when his warnings and admonitions come to a halt. This is what scholars term judicial sentencing. I've mentioned it many times. When after having been warned and warned and warned and warned and warned time and again, an individual continues to do at will to throw God and his word to the curb, he will end up there himself and that judicially, and finally. And that, of course, means eternally. Once a decision to leave someone where they are bound and determined to go, it becomes judicial, legal, and worst of all, irreversible. That's the big problem with these injections. Whatever they're doing, whatever it's doing, it's irreversible doesn't just even out somehow, you know, the body rejuvenates, doesn't do that. It's absolutely irreversible. And this is, of course, on purpose. But we see this with Pharaoh not letting the people go, this wanting something, or King Saul doing his own thing, Esau throwing away his birthright, the Pharisees and Sadducees purposefully denying to recognize Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Messiah, even though they knew he had to be the one, for he actually fulfilled the scriptures about the Messiah, and they knew those. For true saints in their times of weakness, and because the Lord is love, he never wholly throws us out to the curb, but he gives us rest from his truth and common sense reasoning so that we'll get the chance that he wants us to have in obeying him. That's how kind our God is. Yep, went off again the other day. God didn't throw me to the curb eternally because of that. 
because I'm a believer. That's good news. <laughs> However, that said, there's a line drawn in the sand, isn't there? The madness ensures that there finally comes a time when all freely given escape routes have been wasted and there's nothing left but to have to pay the piper. This is that fact is never usually brought up when someone witnesses because they think it's going to turn someone off. Well, if that turns them off, they'll never come because they, 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 if they, if they come because they think they're going to, life's going to be wonderful, they don't even know what it's all about. It's a lie. Like John Wayne said, life is tough, pilgrim, and it's even tougher if you're stupid. <laughs> And that's a fact. Many of us are stupid. We're just stupid. It's like, what do we do what we do? So this all reminds me of the very fact that canon, as in the canon of Scripture, is a word made up of two Hebrew and Greek terms, or one each, and it means measuring rod or cane. So the Bible is our level our plumb bob, our string line to keep our decisions straight. It is our guide to everything needed in life and this is why only the truth can meet all these needs. The idea is that if one follows the cane or rod in its straightness, one will have a straight line or path to eternal life residing in the presence of God who as yet is invisible to us. I'd love to see the Lord but he's invisible to us. But I'm going to see the Lord. In my time, I'm not starting out like a little one. I've lived most of my life. Woo! Not to mention the rapture is surely around the corner, and I mean that. So the Bible is our standard for honoring God and for all correct living on this earth being made in his image. And all other facts about this earthly life are out there as well. But only the Bible, the 66 books, are the canon about the who, how, what, and where. So the deceiver continues to deceive. He's the counter to God with his own report. In fact, his report is a mishmash of many reports. And confusion equals madness. And that's the name of his game. We're offered different false teachings and religions and ideas about the origin of the earth and us and life and, 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 and. Ad infinitum, ad absurdum, ad I'm going to puke them. Many think that it makes more sense to have a bunch of different possibilities and that they somehow all come together as one. Another acquaintance of mine to whom I was once witnessing, flat out told me that there couldn't be just one way. There had to be several or many. A very intelligent individual. What a delusion. I just quit. There was nothing more to say. We were sitting in a truck cab coming home from skiing. Never will forget it. And we went over on this thing. and So that was that. He ended that witnessing, not me. For my little part, I had to make it almost like judicial. I had to quit, you see, because it wasn't going anywhere. Now, in contrast to this very many, God states unequivocally that his report is the only one true and final say-so on the matter. It's the only non-confusing stand anyone could want. I mean, how many, I've mentioned this too, how many of you stood there at the, at the rack, especially you girls, I just don't know, I like this, this, and this. I just don't know which one I want. I'll get them all. <laughs> hey, give me that credit card. All these different beans in the can. And now we have canned meat and everything. I mean, it's been around for a long time, but I'm just saying, all this, all these choices. 
When meat was fresh, you had to you can buy it today, maybe tomorrow. After that, you're too late to buy it, depending on the temperature and the time of year and all that, <laughs> and who you trust in preparing this meat that was hung on the on the hook at the marketplace, right? Mm-hmm. See, most want to be confused, which is the other amazing thing that's madness. They're afraid of choosing the wrong one. I've heard this once. I've heard it a thousand times. And that's why God says, mine is the truth. You don't have to guess, worry, or wonder. Mine is the truth. And here's how I prove it. I sent my son. I raised the dead. I healed the sick. I cast out devils. And you can take that tree And know it was created because it goes back to the seed, back to the tree, 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 back to tree B. I know that sounded a little funny, but tree B. (laughs) And that's also why all other so-called teachings can agree with each other on most points, if not all. True biblical Christianity cannot. Christianity is here. Everybody else is over there. Mm -hmm. There's no tether, no connection, no arrow pointing, no nothing. This is all by itself, which makes this holy. It stands alone and successfully confronts and defeats all comers because none of them are canon. Oh, 2 Corinthians. Today I have over 3,000 words in my little speech. Usually it's only about 1,800 to 25. So that tells you you're going to be here a while. 2 Corinthians. That's right after 1 Corinthians. That's right, before Galatians. Are you there? 14, 6, 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial or the devil? Mm. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? That's why we're not to marry unbelievers. And what agreement has the temple with God or of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. All of this is the new covenant we just, we just uh, toasted, so to speak, yeah. with communion. And it's Jeremiah 31, 31 promise came to pass. Verse 17, therefore, come out from among them. Among what? Among the world, among the godless twits, among the heathen. And be ye separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. And you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Hmm. I love it. So to prove that his word is the truth, the Lord actually gave us concrete answers as to the who, how, what, and where. And there's no writing, no theory, no teaching known to man outside of the Bible that goes to this extent, not one. All others or all other offers, that is, as to what life on earth really means, are enshrined in mysteries and secrets and potions and lotions and enchantments of all kinds. Pseudoscience, or pseudo-knowledge, is now the new truth, but in fact, it's always been that. Back in Paul's day, in 1 Timothy 6.20, he says, stick with the truth, Tim, and don't be caught up with that which is falsely called science. The New King James says, I think the Old King James says knowledge. Either way, it means the same. They've always claimed that knowledge trumps the word of God. What a bunch of nonsense. 
And of course, all this brings us to where we are today. While crime has plagued humanity generally, it is actually exponentially getting not just worse, but more acceptable today in society. It's acceptable. If you steal less than $600 worth in many places, oh, we don't even, don't, just forget it. The madness is demonstrated by the current so-called socialist administration the world is now under. Of course, the main term they express to fool the people remains, namely the lie of democracy. See, they blame the people. You voted them in. You voted for that resolution. You did. You freely voted. That's why you're where you're at. Total chaos and absolute destruction is what's planned against all of us by the devil and his minions, angelic and human. So human think tanks are the leading intelligence organizations, including the CIA, and 15 of the Europe's top agencies have decided on the year 2025 for the socialist program to be near its completion. This was published back in 2010. And it's been going on for hundreds of years. And if you, have, if you know anything about uh, you know, 1985 or 1984, whatever the book is, it's, uh, it's right on the money and uh, the other works that were written as well. See, Satan, he can't do anything otherwise. He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy, John 10.10. Unless some think otherwise, Satan does not spare his own. All are destined to be destroyed along with him. It's part of the madness. It's collective madness to side with the devil and believe his report. It's full of lies, but that doesn't matter. Anything but God and his word, you know, sin, and I got to do something, and I... I want to go party and have fun. So most want the pleasure now. No waiting for heaven for them. Simply too boring. See, Satan's report confuses on purpose. It gives impossible answers that don't and can't satisfy even just mere facts, let alone the truth. Look at how many people are looking for truth. They want to find some holy man somewhere or some organization, some psychobabble nonsense to get into the spirit world where they have no business playing because they can't control it. So we have organized and individual occurrences, especially with respect to politics and religion. And they're pointed to as someone or something to blame. And so an enemy is created that leads away from Satan and points to ourselves eventually. You know, you should have voted the other way. I mentioned that earlier. Blaming always points away from the culprit. For the West, it's the East. For the East, it's the West. Then individuals are named. Actions they take are labeled. Someone is always the fall guy. Currently, the worst is Putin. Before him, it was Assad of Syria, or Gaddafi, or Saddam Hussein, or the Chinese, or the Spics, or the Jews, or the Krauts, or the Niggers, or the Honkies, or the Holy Rollers. Somebody is at fault. And we have special names like that for them. It's never just us. And the whole time, Satan is licking his lips, so to speak. What a bunch of stupid humans. We are that without Christ Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who gave us the way and made it straight and wrote it down. Here it is, a copy of it. A flawed copy, yeah. It's not the original Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, but it's still good. It still tells me the truth. It still lifts up Jesus, who is the Christ. So we'd much rather be confronted by roadblocks of all kinds. And we hit as many potholes as possible along this road to eternity. That's like on the way home. 
Nobody has as many potholes as on the way home. <laughs> so no wonder we're referred to as sheep throughout Scripture. Have you ever watched a bunch of sheep do whatever they do? They don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know where they're walking. <laughs> I mean, that's, we're constantly like sheep, like we don't know what's going on. And yet, and even those who are Christians have done so. When God reaches us through his word and only God can save, man, something wonderful happens. When I got saved, my life didn't get better as far as the everyday life, but my life got a whole bunch better. <laughs> I had peace of soul. So to keep the majority following him, Satan doles out successes to certain people, special loyal adherents, and he bestows all the stuff we know, rich and famous, and especially to those who excitedly sell him their soul. They have to do this because he can't take it. He is not allowed to just take it. He doesn't have the power. He doesn't have the money even. It must be offered to him before he can say yes. We like to think he comes around, slaps us upside the head and says, you're coming with me. Not possible. Jesus has all power. Satan doesn't have that power, not even over the world. It's that the world gives him their power, and it's that power that he works with, through politics especially, and education and all the rest. So these godless fools in the world are mad. They're forsaken the true path and pursue what they believe to be godhood through the self. They have easily bought into the lie that they are worth it. And this is madness. And I remember the hair shampoo commercial, you know. She'd shake her head and long, flowing hair. And then she'd go, because I'm worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Back in the 70s or whatever that was, L'Oreal or some commercial. It's crazy. But you see, that innocent-seeming commercial fed what? I'm worth it. Psychobabble says, hey, you're worth it. You lack self-love. Jesus says, no, you got so much self-love that you're a sinner. You keep loving yourself. Knock it off. Love others. And psychobabble says, oh, no, you got... Your See, it's a complete opposite of the truth. It's a lie. is absolutely the complete opposite. So the moment we veer off God's path for us, which leads to righteousness, we very quickly find ourselves in major deception and on the road to ruin in some way or other. It would be one thing if this ruin pertained only to this life, bad enough for sure, but it's worse than that, much worse. All those afflicted in this way of deception are headed for an eternity of destruction. Is that not madness? So not caring for God one way or the other automatically puts, or buys one rather, a trip to the lake of fire. You didn't even know you were standing in line at the ticket booth. Rides to lake of fire. Plenty of openings. <laughs> Bring it on. How much? Your soul. And we say, hear you. Only answering the call of God by every soul to forsake the world, the devil, and the flesh will one get off this automated ride to hell. Answering the call has been made available to everyone in their respective lifetimes. God made sure of it. It is the beauty of the gospel to repent and be saved eternally. Hallelujah. And to aid him in this endeavor, you and I and all the saints on earth have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Mm. And that is we must not blow the chance to witness for Christ when we're given the opportunity. 
Usually God will already have prepared someone's heart to receive his truth through you in some way. And when the Lord opens the door of opportunity, we must act. This is the part of the faith without works. If you believe God, but you never witness to anybody, even though you have an opportunity, however little you think it is, however thin you think it is, however worthless you think it is, however you think, oh, I don't have the right words, I don't know what to say, it doesn't matter, God will speak through you. He promises that anyway. And why would I want to speak to somebody? I want them to hear God. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's just the thing. Otherwise, I could save him myself. It'd be a short eternity if I saved somebody. So when we do this, according to the leading of the Holy Spirit, we help keep someone from the madness. Everybody go to 1 Timothy 4. We help them from the madness and the soon following trip to hell. And interestingly, that this in turn will lead to life everlasting for ourselves. Listen, when you witness, it leads to life for yourself as well. Are you aware of that? And for that someone to whom God has given us access in order to be a witness using the true gospel of the Lord Jesus. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. First Timothy. Are you ready for wonderful? Yes. Oh. Oh, if I could only find where they are. There it is. Chapter 4. First Timothy 4. Verse 16. Just before you get to 5. Look what he's telling a young believer, strong young believer, who's actually heading up a church. Take, take heed to yourself, Timothy, and to the doctrine, that is, to the true teaching. Continue in them, this doctrine, and in taking care of yourself. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Well, I'm already saved. I know, but it's about continuing, isn't it? Yeah. It's about holding on. It's about fighting the fight. Mm -hmm. See, that's, what, that's why he tells Timothy, in fact, it's Timothy that he tells that, hey, I fought the good fight. I run my race, etc., etc. It's all about continuing in faith. Come to faith and stay there. That's what it's about. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for given us you. Your sinless self qualified you for the cross and allowing yourself for others, pagans even, to take your life. You said, no one takes it, I give it. And I have power to raise it back up. In Scripture, Lord, you let us know that you raised yourself up the Father raised you up, and the Holy Spirit raised you up. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Lift up Pastor Eric to you, and Brian and Hannah, and you know them all, Lord. All those who are persecuted for your name's sake, that number only gets bigger every day. But you're up to the challenge because you're the Lord and everything is possible with you and nothing is impossible. And as much as someone has an inkling of choice, if that your word says that you will not, you know, snuff out the, the little amber and you will not continue to uh, completely break off the broken reed. We may be kinked and broken, Lord. But we believe you. You are our Lord. You are our Savior. You are God and you are our King as well as our prophet. And we fully trust you to come and collect us, Lord, at your perfect timing, at the fullness of the Gentiles. Let it be today, if possible. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.